This is the Small Mouth Crush Podcast. If you're a hardcore angler, you've come to the right place. This is a weekly podcast that will interview some of the top smallmouth bass anglers in North America. Travis and his guest will discuss what it takes to consistently catch big smallmouth, and you'll get a glimpse inside the mind of a trophy smallmouth angler. And now, here's your host of the Smallmouth Crush Podcast, Travis Manson. Hello, welcome to the Smallmouth Crush Podcast. My name is Travis Manson. Can you believe it? Another week talking smallmouth fishing. I love it. There's just something about big old smallmouth that gets me going. And I know a lot of viewers as well as listeners here on the Smallmouth Crush YouTube channel appreciate that. We have another Canadian uh, joining us this week. This guy catches fish all over, not only North America, but I, th- I think he's been around the world. But he loves catching smallmouth, and so I'm really, really excited uh, to be talking with our next guest uh, coming up shortly. But before we go there, let's talk about the real shot. Of course, the real shot is becoming the number one tackle store for smallmouth crush fans. They carry everything. I mean everything. Top brands, Mega Bass, Jackal, Evergreen, Z-Man, Shimano, Daiwa, Omega, Kitex. I don't know. The list goes on and on. They got a bunch of tackle. Head on over to therealshot.com and use my promo code smallmouthcrush15, and we're going to get you 15% off your first order. So very cool. We appreciate The Real Shot's support of this podcast. And, of course, they have a bunch of gear. So uh, head on over there, smallmouthcrush15, and get you some of that tackle. Without further ado, JP. What's going on, man? The myth, the legend. How are you doing? (laughs) I'm doing great, dude. I mean, other than being locked down here in Canada, uh, mm-hmm. doing uh, doing real good. Uh, busy, so it's it's a busy time of year. This time of year, editing, delivering shows, new product coming out. Uh, you know, so if I'm going to be locked down, this is when I want to be locked down. Right, right. Totally get it. I mean, you know, I'm excited. We have a lot of what. What is it with Canadians and smallmouth, man? You guys just know how to. You guys know how to catch fish. Uh, I'm excited to talk to you because I want to. I want to feel you know your take on on smallmouth fishing. I know you chase a lot of different species, but I feel somewhere somewhere inside you, uh, JP's a, a love for for smallmouth bass. Can you talk to me a little bit about that as well? Give us just a quick background on yourself too. Sure. Uh, you know, I've been kind of obsessed with fishing as far back as I can remember. Uh, it's it's kind of funny. I tell this story a lot, but my dad always used to tell his friends. When I was a kid, he said, if I ever cracked my son's head open, he figures he'd find a fish swimming around in there. <laughs> so it's been a passion of mine as long as I can remember. Um, smallmouth, I mean, if you're Canadian and you don't love smallmouth, you lose your Canadian citizenship. I think that's the rule. It's it's not really written anywhere, but mm-hmm. you have to love smallmouth if you're Canadian. But I'm also a diehard largemouth fisherman. I mean, getting down and dirty in the weeds and slop. So I've actually learned that I love all kinds of fish. Mm-hmm. I, I have a, a place in my heart for smallmouth, but I love all kinds of fish. So uh, the backstory on me, uh, I was, you know, high school, played a lot of varsity football, track and field, very competitive growing up, soccer, played every sport you could imagine. And then when high school ended and I left university, I kind of had that longing to continue competition. That competitive side of me just wanted to keep going. And I found tournament fishing. So I kind of found it late in my life, not like some of these kids, you know, like the Johnson boys who I remember Lynn, their father, driving them to the ramp to fish against us when they were 10 years old or 12 years old. I started at 26 or 27 years old. I started tournament fishing, but I went in head first, uh, 30 to 40 club tournaments a year, as many tournaments as I could put my hands on. And it filled that little void in my life for competition and then uh, got pretty serious about it. And WFN, the World Fishing Network, started. They were going to film our series. They interviewed all the guys fishing the Super Series back then. It was the uh, CRK Super Series. And it was the first $100,000 tournament ever in Canada on Lake Simcoe. Mm-hmm. So they were going to film the series. They interviewed all the guys fishing. And they said to me, you know, you're a dead ringer on camera. And I was like, okay, I'm a caterer by trade. That's what I did for a living. And uh, I was an art major and a caterer. Mm-hmm. So... They said, you're a dead ringer on camera. They offered me a sponsorship, wrapped my boat and truck, paid my entry fees, WFN, and then sent me to ICAST that summer to do interviews at ICAST. And I had never been to ICAST. I had never been on camera. And it was 
me and a camera guy. So I went down there and did a bunch of web videos for them. They watched them, called me in their office and said, dude, you need a show like now. And that's how it all started. Wow. Right place, right time. Yeah. So many, yeah. so many endless hours on the water. So many endless hours behind a computer editing, doing, putting out content. Uh, and, and yes, I agree. You're, you're great at it. You definitely found your co your calling. Uh, you know, speaking of, of Northern Canadian fishing, these tournaments when you started fishing, uh, you know, growing up in your mid twenties and, and later, yep. were they specifically in, in Canada or did you get to the States or did you start traveling all over the, the country chasing bass? It wasn't until I started fishing the TBF stuff that I started venturing to the States where I did a uh, Eastern divisionals on Champlain a couple times. I did the Eastern divisionals on, um, Connecticut river, which I would never want to go back to again. Actually, yeah. I kind of liked it. I finished second there, so it's okay. <laughs> But it's a tough fishery. Uh, and then I ended up at the Nationals in uh, Oklahoma at Grand Lake. So I started to stretch a bit there. But at the same time, I was filming my show. So Chautauqua was on my hit list all the time. And I mean, you want a better smallmouth lake in the spring. It was hard to beat back then, mm -hmm. Chautauqua or Erie. Mm. So I spent a lot of time down there. And I grew up in Texas. So, but that was, I was on the saltwater side, North Padre Island. So ah. I had my, my spatterings of us fishing throughout the years. Sure. I, I gotcha. As far as lakes that you like just fell in love with when it comes to smallmouth fishing, could you name a handful that you really just have a, a place in your heart that you just, you, you can't wait to get back to them every year or, or Saint as Claire. often as you can St. Clair. St. Clair is one of them. St. Clair for sure. Chautauqua's got a place in my heart because I filmed shows on it and I figured out that they live in two feet of water in the spring and I, Absolutely love sight fishing. Thousand Islands, so the St. Lawrence River. And obviously, I live 20 minutes from Lake Simcoe. But for me, Simcoe's a love-hate relationship. It's really good at the end of June when the season opens until throughout July. But it can be the most fickle monster come August and into September. Really? It's not like any other fishery I've ever experienced. I mean, they're there they're not there they'll chase they won't eat they're just it's and then all of a sudden in the afternoon if the sun's up you'll get a bite window and you put 27 pounds in the boat uh, it's just it's just a it's a love hate with simcoe for sure so you hear all these stories you know massive weights coming from there i just assumed you anybody rolls up in there and you're just cracking on them no 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 i remember years ago we had a one of the national championships for the uh for bass was here for the uh, i guess the fed nation and I had a buddy of mine from uh, Massachusetts, I believe it was, was coming here to fish. So I helped him out. I said, I gave him a bunch of spots and I called him after the first day and I said, how you do? And he said, oh, I got 14 pounds. Mm. I'm like, okay, that keeps you in it. And he goes, no, man. He goes, the leader from my state it has like 27 pounds or 26 pounds or some ridiculous number. And I said, he has just as much chance to catch one pound tomorrow. Sure enough, next day, one pound. The guy who I gave the spots to weighed a consistent 14 to 17 and won his division. So it's that's it's that fickle. Oh, no, thanks. Yeah. That's yeah. scary, dude. I mean, <laughs> you hear all these stories. So really, uh, when you're obviously uh, Canadian seasons open a lot later than they do in the States. Uh, yeah. So you got to deal with that. But once you can get on there, there's a good window, you say, through July where you can consistently get on them. What happens? Do they, are they are they just chasing bait offshore or, or why is it no. so hard? No, no, they're so. The spawn happens, it starts in May up here, like it does in most northern states, um, and we'll roll through. You can find them on beds in the middle of July sometimes, the, the deeper beds, you know, the 14 to 18, 20-foot beds. Mm -hmm. Remember, Simcoe is kind of like Erie in the, in the clarity sense, except it never gets blown out like Erie does. Never do you get, uh, you know, the Cataragus and Silver Creek and all these mouths of these rivers blowing trees and mud into the lake. You don't get that on Simcoe. So it's clear outside of algae bloom. Mm -hmm. um so the fish do spawn deeper the easy ones that are in under 10 feet of water are picked off right away but once the spawn finishes the post spawn thing becomes a craw chase in simcoe they start to actually uh look around when we get the the full moons and those craw start shedding their shells and everything else happens i've i've seen it in days where the bottoms in six feet or four feet of water are crawling with crayfish hmm. and there's just five and six pound smallmouth swimming everywhere Wow. So uh, it's more of a shallow bite through July. Really, you can visually fish them all through July. Fluff, spy baits, jerk baits, drop shot, tube, craw. I did a show this year using a chatterbait. So you can catch them pretty much any way you want. 
Um, but once it gets past that, I think they start to split and those offshore pelagic fish move out there and get on the smelt and the herring. Mm. And they're not hanging in those shallows, except for small windows. What's your favorite technique when, when they do get up shallow? Uh, you mentioned one of your favorite ways to fish is, is sight fishing and up shallow. I'm sure, you know, you're targeting cruisers. I, so I like to have a one, two, and it, it depends on the mood of the fish. Obviously I want to have one moving that I can cover water and get a chance to see where they're at or if they're in the area. Once they're in them, it's a tough call. A 2.8 jackal rhythm wave mm. on a one eighth ounce head to me is the one bait I can go anywhere in the world and catch fish on and smallmouth are not exempt to that bait. I mean, the net is great. A turd is great. Um, a drop shot is great. They all have their days day in, day out. If they're on, uh, emeralds or smelt or anything like that i'm going to use the more natural silver blue colors or whites if they're on gobies i'm going green pumpkin or we made a color made specifically called goby so mm -hmm. i can fish it straight reeling it slow and steady like a spy bait i can work it on the bottom like a bottom feeding goby it, it, to me it's the number one bait i can throw real versatile and i assume you fish that deep as well throughout the year absolutely yeah um mm -hmm. i'll go as deep as probably 20 feet with it Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not going to go super deep because I don't like the outsizing of the head. You know, you start getting into the heavier heads if you're trying not to go tungsten, which, you know, everybody knows you start snagging tungstens. They're not exactly the cheapest mm -hmm. things to start losing. Uh, I want to keep that proportion of that head. So I find up to a quarter would be about the right size head. And I throw a mushroom style head that I pour myself with a screw lock on the shank. Ah, okay. So that screw lock is going to actually help, you know, a lot of times with swim baits, you can catch maybe one or two if you're lucky. You're probably you're probably able to use that bait. Oh, 30 fish sometimes. I mean, oh, wow. like the jackals, that's one thing about jackal baits is they're very durable. If you've ever thrown a rhythm wave, whether it's a 3.8 or a 2.8, incredibly, incredibly durable. And I like that about that. There's a lot of baits on there that the tails get bit off rather easy. They work. They all work. Mm -hmm. But for me, I'm, I'm a lazy slug when it comes <laughs> sure. to this stuff. So give me a bait that's going to catch fish and be durable. You got all my attention. Talk to me about when, when you go to a new body of water that, that you may not be familiar with and you're trying to locate smallmouth. I know there's a lot of, I guess, situations you could have, you know, your shallow fish. There's, in my opinion, a lot of these bodies of water that are just known for big smallmouth. There's always a shallow pattern. There's always a deep pattern. How do you approach that? Are you looking deep or are you going to look shallow first? My problem with deep, Travis, more than anything, is the fact that you don't know what you're marking when you're deep. Mm -hmm. Could be sheephead, mm. could be carp, could right. be walleye, could be sturgeon on the St. Lawrence. You just don't know. So for me, I go shallow first because I'm going to let my eyes tell me, A, are they the right size? Or first, if they're there, and if they're there, are they the ones I want to win a tournament on? Mm. And some days they're just the big ones aren't up shallow. And then I go from there. Then I'll go mid and then I'll go deep. Any body of water. Shallow is the first. If it's clear, it's the first place I go. Yeah, always shallow. What are you looking for when you go shallow? Because you can pull out a map. And I, I love asking this question to guys that are really, you know, specific with that shallow bite. Uh, there's so much out there. You know, I'm just pick a lake, Lake Ontario, St. Lawrence River. There's there's a lot of shallow water to cover and not <laughs> enough hours to empty. take. <laughs> yeah. How do you, what are you looking for? First thing I look for, any of the lakes up here, the northern lakes, is sand. That white sand is, uh, you know, everybody thinks rock when they think smallmouth. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's great to have rocks and it's great to have an isolated, but if I can find an isolated boulder on sand or I can find a sand patch with weed around it, I'm keying in on that. I mean, they're, they're easy to see. They're bright. They're white. They're turquoise blue in the St. Lawrence. I mean, you know, you've seen them. Mm -hmm. They're simple to see. Um, a lot of times I do a lot of video work, so I put a drone up on areas. Uh, I mean, you want to find sand patches, throw a drone in the air. You, yeah. You'll find every single one of them in no time. So Good little point. tricks yeah. that I do is it's, it's, if I'm shallow, I'm looking for sand up here. That drone idea, but that gives you an aerial view, especially on a calm, sunny day. Maybe you yeah. shouldn't have said that. Oh, no. <laughs> now we're, now we're going to have a bunch of drones up there. Yeah. Well, the thing is with the drones uh, is that you can face the camera straight down if you got the right one. And when you do that, you eliminate the need for polarization or anything because you're, you're not getting that bounce of light off the surface anymore. So you can really, I've seen white spots in 20 feet of water on a drone in the St. Lawrence. So mm -hmm. I know where the shell beds end and where the sand begins on those runs. That's gold out there. 
Yeah. Wow. What do you think your 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 main strength is when it when it comes to smallmouth fishing? I think knowing if they're going to bite or not. I think my ability okay. to read their body language is probably my best strength uh, in in the sight fishing world. You know, just sure. I could tell by their posture. It's almost like you know you you do this as much as I do, and there's the Johnsons are probably two of the best at it that I've ever seen. You know, I know the way that fish reacts, the way his pec fins move, the way his body language is, whether he bends or bows or ignores. I know within forecast whether I'm going to even waste another minute on that fish. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think that's my biggest thing is I've learned after fishing so many years shallow, just how to read the fish. I mean, that's that's awesome because I know it can be so frustrating. I'm sure you run into this when, when you got a six pounder down there. Three other fish that day bit like nothing. Yep. And then this guy just doesn't want nothing to do with you, but he's not leaving. Right. Do you have any tricks? Like, let's say you really, you had a, a giant. Okay. And it was one of those fish where, you know, he sees you, but he doesn't care. This is very common for those yep. that don't fish, you know, way up North and in some of the great lakes, these fish oftentimes they're, they don't just scoot away and you never see them again. You have visual on them for as long as you stay there, but they won't bite. What are some things that you've tried in the past to get them to bite that you were successful with? Uh, one of the things I try to do is change the level of the bait. That's one of the first things. So, cause it can be remarkably different between a turd on the bottom, a swim bait or a drop shot that is, you know, this high, this mm -hmm. high or this high. So uh, the first thing I do is if they're not biting my say 2.8 rhythm wave, I'm going to throw a turd at them. If I can't get them on a turd, I might just go to, uh, you know, a drop shot and then see how the posture is, then start to read the fish again. Right. Mm -hmm. How is his body reacting to elevation changes in the bait? And once I figure out which one gets the most attention out of them, then I start picking through colors because there's always something. Some days right. you just, you know, if it's big enough and worth your energy, there's always something they're going to eat. So uh -huh. uh, levels and then colors for me. Where is the shallow bite like best at? Do you have a, a general region or area? It's really tough because the shallow bite is getting super educated. So okay. um, when you say shallow, we're talking six feet and under kind of thing or eight feet and under. Yeah. Yep. It's really hard to beat the St. Lawrence mm -hmm. for that. I mean, it's, it is the place has got hundreds of miles on both sides of the border of, you know, perfect sand patches and gravel strips and reed beds. So I think that would probably be the one place I think has the most consistent shallow bite. I mean, I've caught them. I was filming a walleye show November, November 27th this year in St. Francis. Actually, William Clute, who you know, was out there. Yeah. Uh, so Will was out there fishing and I was on that Canadian side. And I said, after I caught like 60 walleye in the morning and I said, you know, let's just go play around, see if we can get a smallmouth for the show. We caught 12 smallmouth in four feet of water in 38 or 40 degree water. Right. November 27th. So sure. St. Lawrence is tough to beat for shallows. I agree. There's some I, I think special. Wisconsin, right? I think other than that, Green Bay, from everything I've heard, I've never experienced it, but has got an incredible, incredible shallow bite as well. Yeah, I think you would uh you would have a field day uh on the Lake Michigan side. Uh, especially up there uh, in Door County, you know, uh, Bay of Green Bay area. Of course, uh, Bay to Knock, uh, Upper Upper Peninsula. But I just got to imagine, you know, just looking at a map at, at the areas where you're from in, in Canadian waters, there's got to be so many inland lakes where this happens as well, I would assume. It, there is. Uh, I think it's a little different. Our inland fish are really mainly because our water is not the same color. And I think it might have to do with something with the build of the water. Mm -hmm. That clear uh, water is a, builds a very different smallmouth than tannic water, in my opinion. Ah, uh, yeah. I feel like tannic smallmouth are a different animal altogether. Mm -hmm. Tannic smallmouth will live under docks and in pad beds. I mean, they'll they'll do just crazy stuff. You'll catch them in weed beds flipping a jig for largemouth. Mm -hmm. So I think for us, a lot of our inland lakes are more of that tannic because we've got uh, the granite base. So most of our inland lakes are granite based, tannic. And I think the fish are just different. Uh, you need two different approaches. Simcoe, Georgian Bay, Lake Ontario, Lake Erie, Lake St. Clair, the St. Lawrence River, I think hold one approach. And mm -hmm. I think my inland lakes, I, I just go at them a little bit differently. Okay. Okay. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because, uh, you, you know, the, the shallow bite, uh, 
especially in that clear water, when you can see them, there's nothing like it. Uh, I want to know what happens when you don't have the best conditions, meaning obviously cloud cover, wind perhaps. Are you bailing on that or are you going to stick to that that game plan? Usually I stick to it for quite a while. That mm. flat light, you know, it's a guide's worst nightmare on the saltwater flats as well. You get that right amount of cloud and that right amount of brightness and you've got, there's no angle you could twist your head where your polarized glasses are going to help you anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the wind, obviously, like you mentioned, but I will do it and I'll throw baits that I know they like to follow so that I could see if they're there and then I'll back off them. So the jerk baits, probably a suspending jerk baits, probably my number one bait to get a fish to come as close to the boat in bad conditions where I could see the fish. Okay. And yeah. then be like, okay, they're here back off anchor out. And then start, you know, going through your set, whether it's the 2.8 rhythm wave, the fluff, the spy bait, a drop shot mm -hmm. and systematically try to get them. Yeah. You're, yeah. You're dead on when you're, when you're trying to locate fish and you have bad visibility and you just need to know if there's still fish up shallow, uh, a reaction bait, a search bait where you can cover water. Uh, so for you, JP, it's a jerk bait. Walk us through the setup uh, as far as, I mean, can you talk about brands and what your favorite jerk yeah, bait sure. is? Yeah, yeah, I've got a few. I mean, I was with Megabass for years, and it's a really hard to beat a Vision 110. It still is to this day. I'm with Jackal, and I absolutely love a lot of the Jackal jerk baits as well. The more recent ones are the new Rerange and the Rerange MR, so they're 110 size. Okay. Uh, my favorite that they stopped bringing in, that if people can get their hands on them, I think they would be absolutely insane not to. I got my pen in my hand right now. The Dow's Vito 9 DSP. Hmm. I have been in a lot of situations where I've gone up against what's considered to be the top jerkbait in the world and just smoked the guys on a Dow's Vito 90 SP. It's really? yeah, it's a little smaller at that 90 millimeter length. It's a deep diver, but if you work it, and this is why I love it so much, if I work it rod across my chest rather than down like traditional jerkbait throwers do, I can get it to really go side to side a lot, like massive. And in cold water, I find it to be the best. I throw it on straight fluoro. So I have two setups for jerk baits. Mm -hmm. Cold water, I'm throwing on a seven foot five medium power, extra fast bait cast, 12 pound fluoro straight. I like it. I think it's the more subtle action of the jerk bait in that colder water temps when they're below, you know, 60 degrees. I think you get more bites. Uh, and then when I'm in prime time, 60 degree plus, and I want to really get a reaction bite, I'm going spinning rods. I'm going, you know, seven foot one medium power extra fast eight pound power pro you know 12 to 14 pound fluorocarbon leader and i can cast the thing 100 miles and work it as fast as i want because what people most mostly don't realize is that spinning reels reel in line a lot faster than bait casters mm. if i throw a stratic 3000 it's got 35 inches of line per handle turn you'd have to throw an eight to one bait caster to be able to compete so the the braid, I assume the braid during during the warmer weather or, or you know warmer water temps is allowing yep. you to to make a make that bait just move a little bit quicker or uh, you have to work your arms or, less too, right? Like it's yeah. One thing about fluoro is you have to put a lot of action. I'm snapping the rod when I'm working a jerk bait, especially that Dow's Vito with fluoro. I'm like it's like hook set after hook set. Mm -hmm. It's exhausting. But it works. So I'm going to do it because it works. And I learned the fluoro trick from Kevin Short. I was down on Dardanelle with him doing a show on jerk baits. And it was actually the Dow's Vito was the bait I was using, which Kevin had a tournament that weekend and took all my Dow's Vitos out of my box uh -huh. for his tournament. I mean, it works that good. And uh, I was throwing on fluoro and you get bit more in that cold water. When you're using the summertime and you got to get that illicit reaction from a fish where it's eat it or don't, the braid makes you be able to do things with light pops of the wrist and impart more action than you can with fluoro on big hook sets. So it, you, it's a it's a conservation thing for me. And you do feel that you'll get a little bit better, you can work that jerkbait better with a spinning rod, real yeah, set? I, I can make it dance, I can make it dance and do more with a spinning rod than I can with a bait cast with fluoro, okay. for sure. That's that's really interesting. I know a lot of guys are going to are taking notes right now. They're probably trying to find these uh these baits that you're talking about right now, but stay with us guys, stay with us. Um, I, I got to dig a little deeper. So let's say I want to get the perfect, uh, spinning rod set up for this. Yep. The action you said was a medium extra, medium extra fast. Yep. And what size length do you recommend? For me, I'm six feet tall. I throw a seven foot one. 
Uh-huh. I mean, I find it works good. I know a lot of guys like to use six sixes or six eights. I find what you lose in casting distance with a shorter rod supersedes the uh, ability to work straight down. Because I really never work, other than the first few pulls to get my jerk bait down to depth, I never work straight down. Right. It's usually on a quarter away. Yeah. And as the bait gets closer, I start to lift the rod higher and higher. Mm-hmm. Because the higher your rod is, the more your bait will dance side to side right. when compared to straight down. Yeah, I see this all the time. I can't agree with you more because it for me it seems awkward to 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 go in the downward like I will certainly do it to get it down and yep. then I find myself going uh you know side to side. So on that setup, the medium extra fast, are you using like a 3000 series or uh, yeah, 3000 line capacity or 2500 really Casting distance is going to be about the same. Being a Shimano guy, I mean, we have our 3000s and 25s. Right. Um, the new ones all have long stroke spool, which is everything from Ultegra up now, which helps mm-hmm. as well. It gives you a little more casting distance, but uh, either or will work. I mean, t- eight pound braid, I'm using Super 8 Slick V2. Okay. Eight pound. Uh, yep. I throw it in usually a high vis or a white. I'm kind of fickle with my gear. So I actually, five, eight, and 10 are the only three braids I use for smallmouth on spinning. And each one's a different color. Hmm. I know if I look at my reel box, my red reels are five. My white reels are eight. Mm-hmm. You know, the Onyx reels are black wow. or 10. Sure. So this way I know there's no question in my mind when I grab a rod, I'm grabbing a five pound, eight pound or 10 pound. Okay. Okay. Right. And so eight is what I would use. And I mean, you could just cast it a country mile. It's just, it's great. And yeah. especially with an FG knot now, right? I, like I'm sure you're on the FG train. Well, should be. I refuse to. Oh, jeez, dude, I'm sorry. I listen. I, I don't know. Yes, I should probably. Yeah, you're right. You're right. <laughs> it's it's it changed my game, especially in the drop shot world, because mm-hmm. um, I never was one that liked to use a swivel to connect braid to drop shot. I hated it because mm-hmm. uh, I like to have 15 or 20 feet of line of leader line on my drop shot but I hated the twist that you get with fluorocarbon when you run straight fluoro, especially if you're deep dropping on Lake Ontario or Erie, you know what it's like, man, you you mark a fish, you reel up really quick, you drop it down, your line's just doing this the whole way up. Yeah. You know, a quarter way through the day, you open your bail and everything barfs off your reel. Mm -hmm. So having braid on a spinning reel and tying the FG knot allows me to put, I'm a big fan of 10 or eight pound fluorocarbon on five pound braid. And I tie an FG knot, spool up 25 feet a liter. I may as well be fishing straight fluoro at that point. Mm. That's why I like it so much. Wow. Okay. So you got me thinking. You know when I'm circling back on this. And and uh, <laughs> I throw my jerk baits a lot on a bait caster. That's what I've always done. One of my weaknesses, I think, is I'm, I'm so stubborn or I'm so used to my ways where you just really just open my eyes right now. This short conversation, about, I'm having ideas now how I can how I can maybe trigger those fish to bite and react a little bit better to a jerk bait by throwing it on a spinning rod. It's a completely different action. You just work them sure. side by side and videotape them underwater. Mm-hmm. The reason I have to run usually I run 14 pound fluoro is because the braid has that zero stretch, and the rod I'm using is so quick on the tip that it, the bait will overrun the braid. Because it's being pulled so hard and you stop so quickly because you're not having to use a lot of movement. It's not like floral where you're doing this and the line's coming with the rod. Mm -hmm. You know, you're working this bait down like this. And if you use straight braid, eventually your bait's going to just overrun. It gets in your split rings. It's a freaking nightmare. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 14 to me, 14 pound floral is the perfect diameter to run as a leader because it's stiff enough to push forward with the bait. The bait will never overrun it. Right. If you run 10, the bait can overrun it. I found 14 to be my catch. Wow. That's huge. You yeah. just saved a bunch of uh a bunch of time and experimentation right there. How how long uh was it 25 feet about? Is well, that- no, so my drop shotting when I'm doing that is a 25 foot leader. But for jerk baiting, I usually run, I want the knot in between the stripper guide and the reel. So if I'm okay. using a seven one and I usually leave about two feet of line when I'm casting, you're probably about seven to eight feet of Leader, okay. Which is perfect. Perfect. And perfect. that just helps me because I'm using high vis braid. I don't want that in the strike zone when I'm working the bait. So let's say we can't find these baits, these uh, discontinued. What's the, the next? What's, what's yeah. What's going to be uh what's your, what was your other go-to as far uh, as re-range, the re-range 110 MR or regular uh, really good. The one thing, if you've ever picked up a re-range before, 
it's it's kind of unique. It's got a tungsten, they call it a TG zero tungsten sliding weight system transfer. But when you cast it, it smacks the back of the weight. It sounds like you whacked your bait off a cowling because mm. that weight smacks the back of the bait. Mm -hmm. So when you cast it the first time, don't think you snapped it off. You didn't. It okay. sounds like that every time you cast it, but it works really well. Cast well. They got some great colors. I mean, it's, and now they got an MR, which we've been begging for for two years. What colors do you tend to use? You have a, a handful that you really rely on? There's three. I'm not like super fussy about whether the tail has a bit of purple on it because I just don't okay. think the jerk bait makes that much of a difference. Uh -huh. I like to throw an albino bait, you know, so like a, a anything white, but I really, when I throw white, I like it when it's not shiny. I like that dull matte white. I think it shows up so much better underwater. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've ever videoed colors underwater. You could take a red crankbait that's got a gloss on it and a red crankbait that's matte, and the matte will have an aura. Uh -huh. around it underwater it'll show up that much better so uh, a matte white uh whether you want to call it french pearl or just bone white or whatever it is uh, i like to have one that is in that smelt pattern mm -hmm. okay so you know blueback herring whatever you want to call it smelt pattern and then i want one that's perch pattern those are uh -huh. my three i don't yep. think i need more than that to catch a fish mm -hmm. on a jerk bait. Mm -hmm. if i do they're smarter than i am yeah, good stuff. This is what we look for here on the uh, on the podcast, man. This was uh this is some really good stuff. I can't believe time's flying here. We, we got uh we, we got a few more minutes here for some questions. Uh JP, I I guess I got to know a couple things. I always ask every guest on the show. First of all, I want to know what your biggest personal best smallmouth is. Yep. And if you could give me a little story or bait that you caught it on and real technical. Uh biggest one is 77. I have seven fish over 7 that I've caught between uh -huh. Simcoe and uh Eerie. Uh, Bist one seven seven on the tried and true technique of dragging a tube. I mean, no, nothing special, really. Sure. Uh -huh. like just dragging a tube in November. I mean, one of the favorite times. I've caught more big fish in the fall than I have in the spring. I'll guarantee you that. I think the fall time, when you get to November and the water temps on Erie get below 47, between 43 and 47, I think is prime time to catch a giant. Yeah. Like yeah. we weighed. This is, we're talking, I got to go back to when, what boat I was running. I think 2008, 2008, uh, we were weighing 28 pounds on Erie in the fall, hmm. which really wasn't happening all that often. I mean, really was not happening all that often back then. So uh, I remember that day that I caught the 7.7, uh, I, got, I got beat for big fish with a 7.21 in a tournament by my buddy with a 7.4. And the next week, I went to the same tournament. It was, uh, they were called the fr uh, Frostbite fall tournament. Simon Frost used to run these tournaments. Uh -huh. And and uh, I went out the next week and caught, we put 142 fish in the boat that day in the tournament. 90 were over five pounds, 90 of them. Like it was, you could catch them on a jigging spoon. Like you mark them, drop a jigging spoon. It was one hop, they'd eat it. Uh -huh. You throw a tube out, you'd catch a five pounder. It was yep. just the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen. And then I finished it with a seven, seven. So dang. Yeah. Dude, that's a stud. That's yeah. a stud. All right. I had one more question, but I got to circle back again because you just, you just hit another topic that I want to learn a little bit more about jigging spoons. So yeah. I'm assuming, I, I don't want to assume, uh, maybe you do use them all, all year long, but colder water temps. I prefer a blade bait, like a silver buddy. I yeah. have a hard time throwing a spoon. I just, I've never got it going. What, what, what am I missing? You're probably not working it hard enough. Uh -huh. I mean, really, uh, the more aggressive you are with a jigging spoon, the more bites you will get. And yes, it's a cold water thing. Same as the blade. Mm -hmm. I feel like the blade takes over, though, where the jigging spoon stops. I think when it gets below a certain temperature, the blade is better than a jigging spoon. Okay. And I believe that, you know, from that 55 to 47 world or 45 world, the jigging spoon can be just absolutely lights out. Gotcha. Now, uh, Jigging spoons, I mean, they're all, they all work. I've thrown BPS tungsten spoons. Uh, my favorite's still a crippled herring. It's still okay. a tough one to beat. Uh, Hopkins makes yeah. a great spoon. Like everybody throws a Hopkins. So I'm not really super fussy about the type of spoon. It's more my setup and how I work it. Okay. Uh, I like to throw it on, I used to throw it on a 610. I switched now to a seven foot one. Same kind of rod I use with my uh, jerk baits, except bait casting. So seven one medium power, extra fast. 
I run 14 pound fluoro on a bait caster. Okay. And I mm -hmm. set the hook on it when I'm working it. So it's like a pop, 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 as hard as you can. And when that thing falls on a slack line, yeah. next time you go to set, it's already in his mouth. Okay. So, so, so you're, are you actually, uh, casting these or are these vertically fished? So it depends on the mood of the fish. If I'm casting, I prefer using something like the silver buddy. I'll use a jackal keyburn, um, but a blade when I'm casting, a jigging spoon when I'm vertical. I think okay. I think they have their place. Yeah, I've seen it. I've seen it on Erie where I roll and I can't really catch him on a spoon, and you can't catch him drop shotting, and you can't catch him, you know, dragging a swim bait, which is my favorite way to catch him. Mm -hmm. And you know, you throw that damn blade out there, and you make a long bomb football field cast, and just and then let it fall. Right. And just right. count to four and then go to reel and lift again. And he's already on it. Mm. It's tough mm -hmm. to be. If someone wanted to get started and, you know, obviously, uh, fall time, you were, you were talking about that 45 to 55 degree, yeah. Yeah. uh, water. I'm assuming these fish are somewhat deeper. What's, what's the, I mean, will you throw a spoon in 15 or do you prefer like 20, 30? 24 to 50 kind of thing is where okay. I like to use the spoon. I really, if I'm going to be fishing them vertically, I want to have more than 20 feet between me and them. Cause I find between the pinging of the, of the transducers and the noise you're making in the boat and the shadow you can cast in clear water. I think you just push the fish outside. Right. Right. So what, what, what's the best weight or what's a normal, you know, if I was to buy a bunch of spoons and give this three quarters, surprise, probably oh. prime. Oh, wow. Okay. Three quarters is probably your prime weight for that depth. Uh, yep. I throw up to an ounce and a half. When they get on the smelt bite, when they start coughing smelt in the fall, mm. I throw an ounce and a half crippled herring. It's it's a, you know, fairly, fairly substantial. Yeah. Spoon. Man. Yep. Fascinating. Yep. I know, I know there's a bunch of guys that are listening like, man, yeah, we always throw, but it's for me, dude, I just don't have the experience and I've watched you guys. I've, I've seen you, I've seen videos of it and I just, man, I would love to get into an epic spoon bite because i can just imagine how much fun that that could be it's almost you know to me that that blade bite that silver buddy bite is really addicting and i really look forward to that maybe that's why i just kind of gravitate towards that and i don't pick up the spoon as much as i'd like but uh now that we had this conversation definitely i'm definitely well, going to be giving it a try Travis, you know as best as anybody it's it's a confidence thing right i think that mm -hmm. the best bait to throw is the one you're most confident in because mm -hmm. i think you'll catch the most fish on it you know, we film uh, renegade bass all summer long. So I get to follow these guys in Eastern Ontario all over the place. We fish uh, St. Francis. We fish the St. Lawrence River. Uh, we fish some great inland fisheries. And I, I learned something because I've been doing this for six years now. That every guy I film tells me that he can only catch them in this depth of water on this bait on this color. Yeah. But I will film 20 different boats who are catching them in 20 different depths on 20 different baits on 20 different colors. The mm -hmm. best bait is the one you're most confident in. I guarantee you. Good advice. That leads me to my next question. I, I'm going to give you one choice for the, for this coming season. And it's uh, it's a bait. It's one bait you can use for the whole year to catch smallmouth. What are you tying on? Rhythm wave. Really? You're in. You're sold on that. Uh, no, no, no. I'm, I'm, I can tell you right now because I film shows for a living. And if I ever can't get a fish to eat, that's the bait I tie on. Wow. I, I throw two sizes only. I throw the okay. two eight and the three eight. When I'm deeper than twenty, I throw the three eight. I love throwing that thing on. I don't know if you've tried the Freedom Football Head. I'm not even sponsored by the guys, but I'm telling you, this thing is. It was a game changer for me. Freedom Football Head is like an interchangeable hook football head. Yep. They come in a half and a three quarter. And what I did was, and this is a trick that if anybody's writing stuff down, you're going to want this one. Mm -hmm. I was taking a. VMC spinnerbait four rod hook, straight shank, okay, black nickel. And I would take a hitchhiker, thread it onto the hook, and then clasp the eye inside the eye of the hook. So it would sit on the shank. So now you've got a screw lock on the shank of your hook. You twist that onto your football head. Then you take your 3.8 rhythm wave and screw it up the shank of the hook. And now you've got an articulated action. So if you're doing the stroll or you're just slow reeling or bumping, that swim bait can move at 0.9 mile an hour and just have that belly roll and that tail kick. And mm -hmm. yeah, so for the deep, it's really super tough to beat. Jeez. Now I got to spend some more money after this. <laughs> wow. Good stuff, dude. Like, yeah. I don't even know. I know we could talk for. Oh, dude, we could do this all day. Yeah. Dude, this is crazy. <laughs> but yeah, we, this, this was awesome. Almost mind blowing. I know guys are really going to appreciate this. 
Uh, I'm excited, dude. I, I think this was uh, fascinating. It really was. You're just a wealth of information when it comes to fishing, that. dude. And uh, we, we're really happy to have you on. What are some ways that guys can uh, follow you throughout the year and, and uh, follow you on social media and kind of keep up with what you're doing? Uh, yeah, JP DeRose Outdoors on Instagram, all one word. Um, JP DeRose, obviously, on Facebook. I do lives like once every couple of weeks, probably. And I got mm-hmm. a YouTube channel as well under JP DeRose. So they can do, that's the best way. I'm usually trying to post goofy pics and do mm-hmm. videos. I'm, today I'm going to be uploading a video on the new Altegra and doing a complete like mash down breakthrough walkthrough of that reel. So guys can see what the new features are and how it differs from the last one. So those are the easy ways to kind of keep up. And then Waypoint TV, uh, season seven of Breaking Boundaries just started airing yesterday. So awesome. if, you, if you're a fisherman and you don't have Waypoint TV, which is completely free, Completely. Uh, it's full HD on demand. Just go to waypointtv.com. You can. You don't even have to sign up. Wow. Yeah. Hunting and fishing as much as you want to watch of it. Dude, I didn't even know that. It is That's phenomenal, cool. dude. It is It is like, it was the, the, the godsend. I feel like broadcast TV is kind of petering out. Sure. Because the consumer takes things in differently these days. It's not, nobody has time to sit down and set a PVR and for eight o'clock and this and that. Now everybody's like, Oh, I got a couple minutes. Let me grab it on my phone. Mm-hmm. You know, let me watch it on my phone. Let me watch it on my laptop. Let me Chromecast it. Let me airdrop it or airplay it. That's what guys are doing now. Right. So waypoints available on Android as an app on iOS as an app on your computer, on a smart TV. Yep. I mean, if you got a newer Samsung, I believe they have something called Samsung TV plus that it has a channel on. Mm. So that was where we kind of laid our hat. So, that's streaming as well. If you wow. want to see something cool, Travis, go there. Uh, I think it's season five. I, there's a French River show that I did in Ontario on Georgian Bay. Ah, uh-huh. you want to see the dumbest smallmouth you have ever seen in your life? No, I have a buddy. A, I'm very fortunate to have a buddy who guided up there growing up. Mm. And you have to run rapids and stuff to get from the Upper French to the Lower down the Bad River. And he does it in a 17 foot Lund with a 115 tiller. And right. dude, we're running, you see, I have drone footage. I put the drone up as we're running through the rapids and there's literally a foot on each side of solid granite Sure. walls that yeah. you're cutting through. But every fish that came to the boat had a buddy and uh-huh. you could catch the buddy. So we had a, like a, a natural triple between two guys where uh, he hooked, he hooked a big one. I had one on, he hooked one. I boat flip mine. No, he got his in the boat. I was still fighting mine. I grabbed his fish. He grabbed another rod, caught the third one. I swung his other one in. Right. Had another one in my hand, and he pumped the four. So we had 12 pounds for three. That's how dumb they are up there. I'm sold. I'm sold. (laughs) Yeah. All right, guys. Definitely check that out. I'm going to have all the information in the show notes here as well as on the YouTube channel. Uh, JP, again, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much for hanging out with us this week. My pleasure. uh, Man, you're welcome back anytime. I appreciate it. Sounds good. Awesome. Awesome. All right, guys. Thank you very much. And as always, until next time. We'll see you on the water. Thanks so much for listening today. Make sure that you're subscribed to the show and follow us on Instagram at Small Mouth Crush. Also, the YouTube channel, Small Mouth Crush. And if you feel so inclined, please leave us a five-star rating and comment with a review below. And as always, until next time, we'll see you on the water.